you know, whenever somebody would say, oh, you're going to be a starting artist, my response was, I'm not a starving artist, I'm a starting out artist. Friends, and welcome to the 59th episode of Pine Copper Line, the internet's number one printmaking podcast. I'm your host, Miranda Metcalf. I release weekly podcasts with people in the print world who are doing something a bit beyond the expected. So please subscribe on your podcast listening app of choice. You can also find Pine Copper Line on Instagram and Facebook. And you can sign up for our monthly newsletter with print news from around the world, all at pinecopperline.com. We also have a Patreon page, where, if you find yourself liking this little podcast and you want to throw a few dollars our way each month, you can get really cool thank yous like stickers and totes and on-air shout-outs. And speaking of thank yous... Thank you, thank you, and thank you to those of you who are already supporting the show through Patreon. For anyone who has signed up in recent months at the Pine Copper Legend level or higher, and you haven't received a postcard or stickers yet, please let me know. The mail getting in and out of Australia got real weird there for a while, and I'm not sure everything got through. So just drop me a line through Patreon or on Instagram, we're at pine.copper.lime, and I'll make sure to shoot off another batch to you as soon as I can. Printmaking forever, shun the non-believers. My guest this week is LaToya Hobbs. LaToya is a professor at the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore, whose portraits explore the intersection of race, beauty, and identity in women of African descent. And she is also the recent winner of the 2020 Janet and Walter Sondheim Artscape Prize. In this episode, we talk about her childhood growing up in Little Rock, Arkansas, and how her love of dance and the body has led her to create intimate, figurative, and extremely intricate relief prints, all which address the ideas of beauty and cultural identity while re-examining the traditional relationship of artist, model, and viewer. We also talk about self-care while being an artist, a homeschool mom, a teacher, and a professor. So, without further ado, sit back, relax, and prepare to get detailed with LaToya Hobbs. Hi, LaToya. How's it going? I am awesome. How are you, Miranda? I'm very good. Thank you so much for joining me, for giving up a little bit of your evening. I'm really excited to talk to you and learn more about you and your work. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's always a, a great opportunity as artists for us to get to share with our work. Yeah, and I've, it's what's really nice, I think, about this platform, particularly for printmakers, which I didn't realize when I started the podcast, but I've gotten to discover as time has gone on that printmakers spend so much time listening to things in the studio you know, while they're carving, while they're graining a stone, doing all this kind of thing that um, I think it ends up being a really good way to help keep other printmakers company and to help people know a bit more about your work. So it's it's a win-win for everyone, I think. Yeah, definitely. Before we dive in, I would love it if you could just introduce yourself a little bit and answer my who you are, where you are, what you do questions for people. Okay. So hello everybody, uh, my name is LaToya Hobbs. I am a painter and printmaker and educator currently living in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, my hometown is in North Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, with my print practice, I primarily focus on relief, woodcut, and I also do a little bit of monotype as well. I've done some screen printing in the past, but my love is with relief mm. printmaking. So that was who I am, where I am, what I'm doing. And then what was the last thing? That was it. You got it. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I've just That's the best way I've come to kind of sum up when I ask people to introduce themselves, just the overview before we kind of dive in. So that's perfect. You said you, were, you grew up in Little Rock. Can you speak to that experience a little bit and 
what role art had in your life at that time? And were you always drawing? Were you an artsy kid? Did you go to museums? What was that time in your life like? Yeah, so Arkansas is kind of a small, smaller state. Most people refer to it as like a retirement. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, when I was growing up, I really didn't have a lot of interaction with the visual arts. Like I, I was interested in the arts in general. Like I love to sing, I love to dance. And so, you know, I sang in church. I did liturgical dance in church. Mm -hmm. I danced on the dance team in high school. I danced, sang in the choir. Uh, So the arts in general were always a part of my life. I also did visual art as well. So it was mainly just through taking like art classes that were offered in school. And I think my first memories of me like engaging in my art practice were like in kindergarten. I remember the first week my dad bought me this really oversized giraffe coloring book uh-huh. and so I just was really like you know enamored by the size of the the coloring book and all the other kids were so like impressed that my coloring book was so much bigger um <laughs> <laughs> which is probably why I like to work large scale now yeah <laughs> yeah early influences yeah <laughs> Thinking about that. Um, And I remember just, you know, whenever we would have like art projects to do, um, you know, everybody would, I would just really have fun with those. And everybody would kind of like use my artwork as a a way to model what they wanted to do, or the teacher would use it as an example. So um, I've always been really enamored with the arts, uh, just in general. My love is dance. Like if I weren't a visual artist, like if I could choose to be another, to engage in another facet mm-hmm. of the arts, I would definitely be like an Alvin Ailey dancer. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I did visual art all the way up through high school. Um, and then it was when it was time to go to college, I was like, okay, well, you know, time to get a real job now. And then, you know, I, I didn't really have an example of what was possible as in terms of a career in the arts. So it was, you know, time to get a real job. And I know a lot uh-huh. of like, artists experience that like even though it's our passion there may not be a lot of support around it in the home or maybe not even support it's just people really don't know the possibilities of what it means to be an artist and what that looks like as a career path so I actually started out as a biology major when I went to um, college to start undergrad started at the University of Arkansas at Fayetteville it's a little bit it's northern Arkansas like near um, where the Crystal Bridges Museum is if you need a reference in terms of location but I started as a biology major, um, and I really found out through that process, I was just really interested in learning about the body. Like, I really mm. didn't have what that would mean. So I was, you know, pre-med. I wanted to, you know, go to medical school and, like, be a pediatrician. I think that was the doctor. Yeah. <laughs> that a real job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know. But I really found out through that process, like, I didn't enjoy any of the chemistry classes. Mm -hmm. I hated being in the labs. I was always, whenever I was in the lab, I was just thinking about what else I could be doing. Mm -hmm. My mind was always somewhere else. And the only classes that I really enjoyed were, you know, classes where I was learning about the body. Mm -hmm. So like the turning point to me, for me is when I got to like organic chemistry, I was just like, no. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, this is not it. <laughs> you know, and I was just really unhappy with what I was doing. And so um, I really found encouragement through my church at the time. The pastor gave a message about how God gave us our gifts and the things we enjoy mm-hmm. for a reason, and that those are the things that we should be engaging in. So that was kind of motivation for me to really get back into the things that I personally enjoyed. Because, you know, my college experience just wasn't going well at all. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't quite ready to not be a biology major, but I just started like, you know, okay, let me take an art class here. Let me take a dance class here. Just starting to add those things to my schedule. And I, you know, just realized that I was really missing engaging in those activities. So Mm -hmm. I eventually ended up transferring schools and I transferred to the University of Arkansas Little Rock, which is again, my hometown. Um, And I had enough like credits to have a biology major. And so I said, okay, well, let me just try biology one more time. Mm -hmm. But Know, just to make sure, you know, because my family was like, you know, don't give up, don't quit. I think you're giving up too easily. So I said, <laughs> okay, one more try. So I, you know, started as a biology major again, um, but then I still continued to take dance classes and get got back into taking art classes. And But then I just was like, no, this is really not where my heart is and this is not what I need to be doing. And, it, you know, at the time I saw so many um, non-traditional artists and, I mean, excuse me, non-traditional students. Mm-hmm. And what I non-traditional is like there were older people who had like gone to school and then they 
did something that they didn't really enjoy because, you know, they had to just get a job. And so they worked like 10 or 15 years in a field that they didn't enjoy. And now they were back in school trying to do the thing that they really wanted to do in the first place. Mm -hmm. I saw that and I was like, I do, I don't want that to be me. Yeah. <laughs> um, decided to change, even though like I was at this point, I was already like in my senior year. So I just decided to make a change. And then one of my art professors, AJ Smith, who was actually the person I learned printmaking from, he just sat me down and was like, what do you want to do? And I was like, well, I want to be an artist. And he was like, well, you know, you just need to commit to that. And the, so that was like in 2007. So that's when I really decided, OK, I'm going to be an artist as my profession. Um, and so, you know, I changed my major to officially being an art major. And then I, I think I had to stay maybe a year a year and a half longer to finish that degree. Um, but I say that like everything completely changed when I just uh, fully commit to my passion and what I really enjoyed. And that's something that I always tell like younger people. You know, I'm a faculty member at Maryland Institute College of Art right now. And so whenever I hear a student, you know, talk about how, you know, I'm graphic design because my parents want me to do that, but I really love painting or, you know, I really sculpture my advice to them is like you are the only person that's gonna have to <laughs> job every you know so just really think about that you have to make sure that you're you're going to be happy in the end and so I can honestly say when I made the decision like everything started to turn around like I started getting grants and scholarships mm. and yeah it was just really a change for the better so that's kind of how you know my introduction to art and then just really becoming serious about being an artist yeah I just I identify so much with what you were saying about feeling like you're you're supposed to be on this path and trying to make it work and then you know I'm just thinking about like your family encouraging you because you know when there's people in your life that you love and they're kind of faltering, it's difficult to tell if they just need someone to tell them to keep going or if it's really not for them. You know, I feel like that such, can be such a tricky thing because sometimes people get to the other side and they're like, I'm so glad you encouraged me. Like, and sometimes it's really not for them. And that idea of, of that like spiritual side of things, I've heard it described in spiritual context as like a like a burning in your heart, like, and that's what you need to follow. Like you'll actually feel it in your body when you're getting closer to what your calling is. It's, it actually, it's a physical feeling and it's something that I've definitely felt and have never regretted trusting it ever. I also think about it as like the difference between something being difficult and something being hard. Like, like organic chemistry, that's like a difficult thing. Like that is a hard thing to study, but it's, even though it's a difficult subject, it's not hard for somebody who really enjoys that. Totally. Right? And so that's what I, how I feel about art. Like some, some processes of being an artist are difficult, but because it's something that I enjoy, that I'm passionate about, it's easy for me to engage in and to do. And I also really started, somebody, you know, posed the question like, would you do what you do do you love it so much that you would do it even if you're not getting paid for right. it? You know, and because if you love it that much, that means you're going to be passionate about it and you're going to perfect it um, just because it's something that you care about. And when you can engage in something uh, that deeply and that passionately, then it's going to bring about some type of success or some type of reward. Yeah. Yeah. And it's one of those things. It's something we get told our whole lives but actually trusting it, it really, you have to learn to do it. You have to learn that it's not just a fairy tale and that it, it really, truly does. You know, the path opens up for you when you're on the path you're supposed to be on. And because you're engaging in your work, engaging in your practice in a way that is so genuine that it, 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 other people respond to that, you know, and as you said, like you're getting scholarships and grants and these opportunities, because I think, you know, when you're writing an application for something like that, or you're, you're being seen working, there's nothing more appealing and beautiful and, and moving than seeing someone who's on their right path. And I, it's just, yeah, it, it can be hard, though, especially when that path is something like, I want to be an artist, you know, which we get a lot of narratives about like, oh, are, are you going to learn to say, do you want fries with that? Right? Like, these are the jokes people make. But you really, you know, if you stick with that, with that belief, it, it does reward you, I think. Mm -hmm. And I, I never allowed myself to buy into that, like, starving artist mentality. Like, 
you know, whenever somebody would say, oh, you're going to be a starting artist. My response was, I'm not a starving artist. I'm a starting out artist. So yeah. I'm just <laughs> I'm just at the beginning uh, of my career. And, you know, I think sometimes, you know, now we're seeing more examples of people having to become like more savvy and creative in terms of how they engage in their practice as an artist. But I think at the core, if you're still really engaging in what your passion is, you can find ways to be creative, um, you know, just thinking about ways to bring in like different streams of revenue and income. But I think as long as the core of it still goes with your passion and your interest, I think you can still make it work. Yeah. So that's how you sort of found your way from biology into art. But I, I love that, that connection that you were interested in, you know, the body, because that's such a crossover, the way artists and biologists are, have been since time and memoria, so engaged in the body, how it looks, how it moves. And then with your connection to, to dance is all is all just really fascinating sort of ecosystem I guess of of your of your practice did you see that when you were making that transition that at their root in a lot of ways biology and and art have so much connection like that to the the human body well I think that's kind of the reason why I enjoy being a figurative artist so much I just think the body is amazing even though um, primarily I'm doing portraiture but now I'm really working toward um, using more of the entire figure in my work. Uh, so for me, I think I just, as I'm reflecting back on these different things that I've gone to, um, and I even had some other majors in between, you know, transitioning from being a biology major to an art major. Like I tried apparel studies for a, a minute just because I, I enjoy like fashion and clothing. So like, and, but I, as I'm looking back, like all of those things, uh, all of those different experiences, they, I see them evident in my practice now. So I would just say for me, it's more of the fact that I am a figurative artist. It's, that's the way it's manifesting in my practice. Then how did you find printmaking and end up connecting with that in a way that's become such an intimate part of your practice? Purely by happenstance. Um, so in my undergrad program, we had to take um, three hours of credit in each of the disciplines. So regardless of what your major was, you had to take a photography class, you had to take um, a sculpture class, you had to take printmaking, you had to take uh, painting. So when I got, I was a painting major in undergrad when I decided to fully commit to being an artist. And so when it was time for me to take printmaking, I was just, you know, just an uninformed student. Mm -hmm. So I really didn't know what printmaking was. I really didn't know a lot about it. I didn't know a lot of artists who engaged in that practice. Um, I wasn't really taking the time to look at artists. And so I just really wasn't aware of all the possibilities that were available through that medium of printmaking. So the first time that I took that class, you know, I did okay. But, you know, in the back of my mind, I was like, yeah, I'm a painter. Like, I don't really need this mm. uh, class. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, I, I started learning about other artists. And then, you know, as I continued to engage in it, I realized that there was a lot I could have done, like, in that class. Because shortly after I took that class or at the end of it, I learned about, like, Elizabeth Catlett. And, hanging and sculpture practice. And so her imagery just really resonated with me, um, partly um, because there wasn't a lot of representation of African-American artists being shown in my art program, like not in the history classes. And like a lot of the teachers, when they did show artists, there were rarely any black artists shown. Mm -hmm. um, so when mm -hmm. my teacher, A.J. Smith, who was an African-American printmaker, he introduced me to her work and it was just like my eyes were opened at what all could be done with this medium. And so, you know, now that that even though that class was over, I was like, well, I really wish I would have done more in that class. I was like, well, if I had another opportunity to take a class, I could do so much better. And so my professor, he had um, option to do an independent study. So after um, I think I was like maybe a couple semesters before I was supposed to graduate. I started taking independent studies in printmaking just because I wanted to learn more about it and get more abreast in the process. And just because I was so inspired by some of the artists that I was starting to come in contact with, um, Elizabeth Callas work primarily. Mm -hmm. And so then that's when, you know, the love affair kind of started from there. And I feel like this could be a, like a, a good point to sort of transition to some of the, the content of your work. Because as you were saying, 
the work that you were seeing as a student, you weren't seeing a lot of examples of African American artists or African American bodies in the work. And that's one of the things you write about that you're pushing against in your practice is sort of to dismantle the stereotypes based on the the Eurocentric beauty standards and this idea of beauty and cultural identity. Was that something that kind of stemmed from your experience that you just spoke of? Or how did you kind of come to this as something that became one of the driving forces in your making? Well, I really didn't come to a clear working definition of the content in my work until graduate school. Mm -hmm. I did notice that a lot of the images that I were making, they were all of women, all portraits. Um, But I really didn't, you know, pin that I'm working, making work about X, Y, and Z until I got to graduate school. Mm-hmm. So graduate school, I always tell people the difference between graduate school and undergraduate is that undergraduate, you're learning how to make the work. And then in graduate school, you're learning how to write and how to talk about your work. Mm-hmm. Really? <laughs> um, so, you know, I really had to sit down and, and talk and, you know, decide for myself what I was exploring, what my research was going to be centered on. And a lot of that came from experiences that I was able to reflect on while I was living in Arkansas before I I moved to Indiana to attend Purdue University. Um, So I started really focusing on black women and our sense of identity just by uh, my own experiences in terms of um, some of the standards of beauty that I feel like black women in particular are kind of taught to uphold. And we kind of just do it without even questioning Mm. like the you know, where that comes from. And so in particular, I was really studying this this idea of internalized race, racism in relationship to our hair texture and our skin complexion. So kind of exploring these ideas about colorism and also just how we perceive and live in our bodies. So mm-hmm. it really was inspired by my process um, of going natural. It's, uh, that's a term we use in our community. So I had like chemically process hair to make it straight. Um, but, you know, I decided, well, I don't really feel like I need to put these harsh chemicals in my hair to straighten it anymore. And so I decided to, to cut it off. So I wore like a short um, pixie cut for a while. And then I just kind of cut it out until it got to my natural texture. Um, and so I was really surprised. Like I, I, would, I was expecting to, you know, hear stuff you know, comments just from people who aren't, you know, familiar with that process. But um, most of the neg- negative comments that I got were from other Black women. Mm. Um, and so that really, you know, was surprising and it really caused me to ask the question why. Um, and then I also worked around a lot of young people. I used to be a manager at Chick-fil-A before <laughs> I started my graduate school career. But I remember this one incident in particular, there was a young woman who was, you know, had a really fair complexion and it was around prom time and they were talking about their dates and their dresses and, you know, who they were bringing. And then she said that, you know, her parents would be upset if she brought a dark skinned person home. And like that comment just made me stop. I was like, why would you say that? And then another girl was talking who was also, you know, a girl that was had a pretty, pretty fair complexion. Um, And she said that, oh, because dark skinned people are ugly. Like that just really hurt, hurt my heart, you know, to hear other black people talking about us in that in that negative context. And so, you know, I just had a conversation with them. I was like, we can't say that that about us. Like we're all special, we're all beautiful. And, you know, and then again, that really caused me to question why? Why do we have those perceptions um, about ourselves? And so that's kind of where my research started. So I started just asking women how they felt about their hair. I would read um, like hair blogs. Uh, there were a lot of like, this is around the time where, you know, the natural hair movement was really starting to like gain a lot of traction. And so, you know, people were sharing things on social media platforms that, you know, weren't necessarily available before. So you could see more women who were, you know, making this transition from, you know, rejecting these Eurocentric standards of beauty that I have to be, in order to be beautiful, I have to have straight hair or in order to be beautiful, you know, I have to have um, this, you know, really high skin complexion or my body has to be shaped a certain way. So, A lot of the research really stemmed from that, just trying to provide a counter narrative that really uplifts black women, that really um, showcases our beauty. Um, And so for some of that time, like it was kind of hurtful to read a lot of the the comments. And so I had to kind of shift my own mentality in terms of saying that I'm not trying to prove our validation Mm -hmm. to anybody, like, but I'm trying to show 
how I feel about us mm-hmm. without you know, kind of rejecting the gaze of other people, but saying this is how I feel about the women in my community and this is how I feel about myself. When I was reading, you know, doing a little bit of, of, of research before a talk and reading some of your the, the statements about that side of your work and that process, I remember I was made me think back and I think that you and I are probably about the same age. Um, I'm turning 36 this year. And okay, yeah. so and I'm thinking about, you know, who was like the standards of beauty when we were growing up and all of those like synaptic pathways about identity are being formed. And it's like you go down the list, it's like Britney Spears, Paris Hilton, Gwyneth Paltrow, uh, Christina Aguilera. Like these were the women, yeah, that were put on television. It was like, this is your ideal. And there's very little variance in that, in that, you know, that, that sort of type. And, and I just... I think the way that we internalize things, particularly in those formative years, it takes kind of decades to unpack sometimes because we we make it a part of the way we view a world in ways that we don't even realize necessarily. Yeah, and my my goal was not to, you know, tell people how to wear their hair or, you know, how to be in any type of way, but it was really to get people to question where those things come from and if, you know, they're really serving you, right? You know, because I think in in the Black community, kind of a, like, rites of passage from, like, going from, like, girlhood to womanhood is, you know, the first time you're able to get a relaxer. Mm -hmm. And so what does it mean when we're teaching young girls that the first, like, really important thing in their life that they do is something where we're telling them to change something about yourself because it's not up to standard or it's not good enough or you have to change this and make to make it be better in some type of way. And so, you know, that those traditions kind of get passed around and then, you know, we just really don't even question where they come from. As I know so many people who don't even like getting relaxers, but they do it just because that's what they were taught to do. That's what they taught. This is how you're pretty. This is how, you know, to be acceptable. Mm-hmm. You know, I think, you know, with our foreparents and grandparents, it comes from like different places because, you know, there was a time where we had to do those things in order to be even be able to get a job, you know, so you do it. And I think those things are passed down with good intentions. But I think after a certain amount of time, we have to really evaluate when those things are not beneficial to us and when they can start to hurt. And again, it's not really to say, you know, one thing is better than the other, but it's to not judge people when they do make those changes or to assume a certain thing about a person just because how they choose to wear their hair or, you know, and and even now in this climate, just with racial profiling, like if you see a dark skinned person who is tall in stature, like not to make assumptions about that person just based on their physical appearance. So much of it maybe comes down to just like being aware of the why is kind of what I'm, I'm hearing you say is just like, like, look, if you, you, it's your body, do whatever you want with it, but just know just be aware of why, you know, and, and make sure it's coming from a place of intentionality and not just something that, that we've sort of digested. Yeah, just, about, just questioning yourself about where those things come from, you know. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you're saying like that now, you know, with with social media and people were kind of able to share more viewpoints and more sort of tips and tricks about, you know, things like going natural. Do you think that things are any better when you talk to young black women that you work with now in your role as an educator? Do you think that 20 years on from when you were growing up that there is more of an awareness? Yeah, I definitely think so. Um, I've seen a lot um, change with just people just embracing who they are Mm -hmm. and having this monolithic way um, to display blackness. And just, you know, since we're talking about natural hair, because, you know, there's so many blogs and so many influencers uh, and then children have access to so many things. And there's a lot of like intentionality about the proper representation. Right. We always hear this phrase, you know, representation matters. And it really Mm -hmm. does. Like if you don't see an example of yourself that's, you know, intended for the the way that you see yourself, then it's going to be hard to accept that. But, you know, I feel like there's a lot of progression that's happened uh, with women just, you know, having the audacity to accept themselves. And right. I think 
think this goes across like all all races, all platforms. You know, you still have kind of pushback and you know these things that you know are expected of women that are performative, how we're supposed to behave and act and look and dress. But, you know, you see so much push, pushback from that. And a lot of people are saying, this is me. This is who I am. Um, you accept it or you don't. And I, and children are noticing that. Um, and I think a lot of, at least a lot of black mothers that I know, we're very intentional about the images that we expose our children to and how we talk to them about their hair, how we talk to them about their skin, how we talk to them and the words that we use when we're talking about other black people. I think that's really, really important making the difference and just establishing those things from the beginning. So, you know, um, and it's not to say that you won't have those kind of self-esteem image issues because, you know, we all go through that, especially. As but I think it'll just working on that early. And I see a lot more parents being really, really intentional about that. Mm -hmm. And not only like beauty, but just exposing their children to black culture so they can know and have representation of themselves in all facets of life. Another side of your work that I was really taken within the way that you described it was that traditional triad that you call of the that sort of artist model and viewer in that relationship and it's one of my favorite things to think about when it comes to art in terms of you know how do all those individuals interact how is the meaning of work you know, actually established within that. And I just love to hear you speak to your views on it, because I think it's such a fascinating side of the visual arts. Yeah, and I think for me, that really stemmed out of conversations and thinking about the gaze, and particularly the gaze um, of the audience um, on Black women. So mm -hmm. and a lot of times when we see images, historical images of Black women, it's always um, presented from either the person taking the photo or making the art or make producing the image, or you hear from the person who is consuming the image, right? So you never really hear about the voice of the subject mm. in the work. And I think that's really, really important. Again, kind of going back to this idea of representation and black people really being able for us to share our story, to tell us who you are instead of being told who we are by outside influences. Um, and so I was really just thinking about that with relationship to black women and our images re being represented. And so for me as a black woman who represents or produces images of black women, how is what I'm doing different from say, like a white male painter in the Renaissance who was painting an image of a black woman? Like we're engaging in the same thing, but how is my motivation different from his motivation? And so for me, it's really um, coming from a place of um, providing a platform and also to give a different perspective of beauty and identity, um, but giving the model a sense of authority. In particular, I had a series of works uh, in graduate school that were a part of my series called Beautiful Uprising. And again, it was steeped in this idea of rejecting these Eurocentric standards of beauty. But I did these portraits, uh, these nude portraits of Black women, and I allowed them to write about their experience as a Black woman and how they see themselves you know, how they see themselves in terms of how they identify what's beautiful about them and what's not. Um, and also just the idea of, you know, somebody representing them, their image in an artwork. Uh, so I would take these statements and then I would actually put them in the work. So in these pieces, I would have the first layer would be just an excerpt of their text. And then I would also like use an excerpt of the text as the title of the work. And so for me, this was like a way to make sure that the women were represented like mind and body. So you have the conversation of everybody, right? So you have me showing you my um, desire and how I see the women. You have the viewer ingesting this thing, but then you also have glimpses of the model talking mm -hmm. about how themselves in the in this process as well. Um, so I think, you know, when we think about prior images of black women, um, that was the component that was missing. There was no evidence of their voice. And you can also tell like through some of the imagery, it, it was not intended to empower them. It was intended like to consume them in, in a negative way. So um, I really wanted to challenge myself and really think about how is what I am different doing, you know, how am I doing anything different than what's already been done? Yeah, and that's, that's so significant because as you're saying, it's, you know, images of really just bodies of people of color, you know, across the Western canon of art making, they can so often be used traditionally just almost as just decoration, like the way you'd put like a palm tree on something. Right. 
there's a an indigenous artist here in Australia named Tony Albert who does work along that as well, specifically relating to um, indigenous bodies being used on things like ashtrays and that kind of thing. And mm-hmm. and so I love like what you're doing that's like, so not only are you saying I am a black woman who is taking agency and making these women, these images of black women, but you're saying my subjects have agency as well. And this is how they feel. And that's such a, a beautiful way to directly push back against that really dehumanizing tradition in the Western world that's, you know, goes back hundreds and hundreds of years of people doing this. Yeah. And even when I like how I work is I usually schedule like a photo shoot or a sketching session with um, the models. And so I just tell them like what the sentiment of my work and what I'm trying to express is. But then I say, okay, like show me how, what makes you feel most powerful, but Mm -hmm. what makes you feel comfortable. Um, if it's, you know, clothing, I'm like bringing in something that makes you feel beautiful and powerful. So they're, you know, I see us, we're kind of like collaborators in the process. You've also written sort of really interestingly about how the actual physical act of cutting the linoleum has kind of a catharsis and that, that idea of like cutting away negative ideologies as right. well. I'd love to hear you talk about that praxis of what you do. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, so I was kind of thinking about like printmaking as a process. It's a very process driven medium. Um, but I think sometimes we can get a little bit too heavy laden just in terms of the process, like just me talking about how I'm making the work. But I really wanted to think about why this process was so appealing to me. Like, why is relief so important? Why am I so drawn uh, to this process? Um, Part of it is just because I really enjoy texture. I'm the person in the museum who, like, the docents have to tell this (laughs) thing. Because I'm, like, getting so close, I'm like, I just want to touch it. But aside from me enjoying the texture, I really wanted to think about what this process means to me. And so thinking about the content and that I discussed earlier just about how black women have to work really hard to get rid of these negative stereotypes that are placed on us by other people. And even sometimes the, um, the things that we place on ourselves. So for me, this act of like carving away from my block or my matrix to reveal the image is, I feel like we have to do that on a daily basis. Being away, you know, like it just, it, even with this time now, um, you see, so much happening um, with police brutality and people are becoming more aware of like all these microaggressions that are happening mm-hmm. to people on a daily basis. And so we we can ingest those things and take those things on and they're just kind of piled on top of us. But we kind of have to do the spiritual work of like shedding those things and carving them away so we can still function and be our authentic selves without, again, having to worry about this idea of like double consciousness. Like I have to be something else outside of my home or outside of this space, mm-hmm. but I can pay every microaggression that I experienced that day, or I can peel away um, all the negative things that I've read in terms of how black people are perceived. I peel those away, but then once I carve those things away, then I can function and show you the real me, show you who I really am and not how you're perceiving me to be, or not the limited stereotype that you only know based on what you've seen on TV. Yeah. And I, th- I think that that love of texture too, that you talk about is something that is such a beautiful side of your work. I think like one of the first things that I noticed when I first saw your work was all of the like incredibly fine and nuanced texture that you have like just on this every surface in your work. And I just think that's, it's wonderful to hear that it has that, that ideological connection as well, as well as just that like aesthetic side of things. Thank you. I'd love to switch gears a little bit and maybe talk about your experiences teaching in Baltimore. And I'd like to hear about the Baltimore art scene as well. Yeah, so I, um, I've i been in Baltimore since 2013. I um, Right out of graduate school, I took a position here at Maryland Institute College of Art um, in the first year experience department. So basically, we work with all the freshman students that come through our program. And, you know, Baltimore has been a great experience for me. Like prior to moving here, I never, I didn't really watch TV much. So mm-hmm. I never like, knew, I had never seen an episode of The Wire uh-huh. before. And so when people would make those references like to The Wire, like I wouldn't even know what they were talking about just because I had never even watched that show, mm-hmm. um, that show before. So, and it's so funny when I, when I um, 
applied and took the position and when I was still living in Indiana, it's like I would just constantly be seeing all these things about Baltimore. Um, like there would be a movie that would come out and the, the city that it would be set, set in Baltimore. Or I remember one time I was at somebody's house and it was a, there was a game on TV and it just happened to be like Purdue was playing another team and it had some other type of um, tie to Baltimore. So I just kept seeing Baltimore. So I took that as a sign that I was like on the right path and coming to the yeah, right place. Yeah. But yeah, so I, I was, when people have the stereotypes, especially when um, incidents happen surrounding the death of Freddie Gray, mm-hmm. I was just amazed about how like selective the news stations were and what they were showing. So they were just really trying to paint this negative picture of Baltimore that tied in um, with what they already were comfortable in sharing about Baltimore. And so I actually, you know, didn't live far from where a lot of those things were happening. I was like, that's not true. That's not happening. And so, you know, I mean, there's bad things and crime that happen everywhere, but there's a lot of really wonderful and great things that happen here in Baltimore, particularly the art scene. Um, So you have, you know, just the DMV area, there's a lot of great arts, art institutions. Um, of course, we have Maryland Institute College of Art here in Baltimore. Um, and then there's also a lot of great cities around. So you have artists from all over that are flooding to this area to set up studios here because, um, you know, compared to like New York or other places, like rent is relatively cheap. Mm-hmm. You get a pretty nice studio for, you know, a, a pretty reasonable price. But yeah, so it's been really rewarding for me, especially teaching at MICA. And not to say that MICA doesn't have its history or, or, you know, racial inequality or doesn't have, you know, negative things that happen. But for me, the most important thing is that I'm surrounded by so many amazing students that come from all over the world. And they bring, you know, all these different experiences and perspectives to our campus that really enrich it. Uh, One of the things that students always talk about in terms of their decision to come to MICA is the, the sense of community that's there. And so, yeah, so it's really it's really enriched my practice just to constantly be surrounded by people who are like either faculty who are serious artists who are you know active in their field or students who are serious about becoming artists and want to be active in the field. So it's always nice to be in this kind of creative atmosphere. Um, and then there's just a lot of really talented artists in Baltimore. You know, a lot's happening, lots going on. Uh, we have a nice, there's, you know, arts district. But again, you know, I don't want to just, you know, pretend like I'm looking through everything with rose-colored right, glasses. Right, There are things that could be done um, in terms of having more visibility, you know, more, you know, diverse representation in museums. But I think, you know, people are making steps in the right direction. You know, there's still, there's still room to go, but I feel like people are making steps in the right direction. You know, as I've been having conversations with people in the arts and people who are in art institutions or or art organizers in these last few weeks, the just the awareness of the institutionalized racism in the arts is at a level I've, I've never, I've never seen before in 10 years in the arts, you know, it comes up almost in every conversation I've been having either through the podcast or just, you know, person to person. And it's 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 incredible and it's wonderful because it was something that I feel like everyone was sort of like, oh, yeah, that yeah, that's a thing we should work on. But just, you know, whether it's, um, you know, the 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 recent emphasis on the Black Lives Matter movement or whether it's just COVID and people having to stop and actually think. But that is something that people are thinking about more in the arts more than I've ever seen. And I really hope that it's not something that's like the the flash in the pan sort of spirit of the moment. And it's will people will really look at ways they can kind of deconstruct those power structures that have been in place since that someone first came up with the idea of a museum. Mm-hmm. So in terms of being a teacher, this is something I'm always curious about, which is that how do you kind of balance your own practice with being a professor and, you know, needing to have energy for your students and needing to have energy for your courses, but also needing to make sure that, as you said, like as a serious artist, that you're feeding your your own work as well? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the story of my life. Um <laughs> So I'm also a mom, too. I have two children. I have a soon-to-be four-year-old and a five-year-old who will be six in the fall. And that kind of goes into, like, what my current series is about, which is called Salt of the Earth. 
Mm. And it's basically personifying women as salt. Um, you know, and I'm talking about that through the lens of a black woman. Um, so it, really it's me exploring kind of this, my ascendance in motherhood and the just balancing all these different roles that I play, but particularly thinking about um, how black women are salt in terms of how we preserve our family, our culture, and our community. Um, and some other underlying themes within that series are just kind of exploring this idea of the matriarch, mm -hmm. um, but also exploring the idea of um, self-preservation, right? And so as you know, women and mothers and artists, like we do so much to pour out to everyone else, but again, how are we making sure that we're pouring into ourselves? So I've been really having um, conversations about just having balance and really making sure that I'm taking care of myself as I'm trying to balance all these different roles that I play. Mm -hmm. So some practical ways to answer that are, I am fortunate that I get to teach on a college campus. And so it's really nice that I have summers off that I'm not teaching, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of hustle season for me. So that's the <laughs> where I, I try to get a lot of work done. Although, you know, I do a lot of work in the school year too, but it really just depends on if I have a show coming up or if I have deadlines that I knew, need to do specific things for. And I also, you know, I'm only on campus, I teach three classes, so I'm only on campus maybe two or three days out of the week. So this past semester, I changed my schedule so that I can do a double on a, like I did a two classes, a morning and a night class on Tuesday, and then I did a Thursday class. And so all the other time I was able to be home uh, with my family, because I also homeschool my children too, which is, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so it's really, you know, I've been really trying to prioritize my time to be really conscious of how I'm spending my time, um, making sure that I don't get sucked in like an Instagram hole for too long. Cause you know, <laughs> you look up and then you've just been scrolling for like 30 minutes when you could have been doing something else. Yeah. So just really being really mindful of my time and how I'm spending it. And also uh, learning to say no and just being really protective of my time and really uh, making myself aware of what the priorities are and putting the most attention and a focus on those. So that's kind of how, you know, I balance my time. So, you know, during the summers, my typical day, you know, starts in the morning. Um, we've been doing homeschool the past couple of weeks just to get you know, kind of got a little bit behind with everything that was happening with COVID-19. And I also had to take some time away to go help my mom with some things. So we wake up, we do homeschool in the morning, we do go outside and play. And then I do all the, you know, Zoom calls, because we are also, you know, preparing for what we're going to do in the fall in terms of trying to do hybrid courses. <laughs> so, I, so teaching is unfortunately had to creep up into my summertime. Um, and then like after dinner and dishes are all put away, then that's when my studio time happens, which, you know, I have to be careful with that too, because, you know, sometimes like I've been getting ready for a deadline the past couple of weeks and I've been like up, you know, to sometimes three and four in the morning, but you know, you can't do that too many days in a row cause it's just not sustainable. Yeah. So it's just, you know, it's a balancing act and again, just me deciding how I'm going to prioritize my time, what's important, what I can let somebody else do, what I can say no to, and, you know, just really thinking about what's important and the most important things that I can focus on. Yeah. And it just sounds like, like just being really intentional about how you're spending your time and your actions and all of that, which is really wonderful, wonderful advice, I think, for anyone who's trying to, to balance wearing, doing so many different things. Mm -hmm. Do you have, like, speaking, I was, do you have any other self-care practices that, I mean, do you, do you like to do a face mask? Like, do you have any, like, how do you, on top of all of that, like, just because I'm thinking of this series that you're working on, you know, aside from that, do you have practices that really help you, like, sustain with all of these different pressures? Yeah, so I just try to find little ways um, to give myself breaks or treats. So our music is really important to me. Um, and I realized like when the babies were young, like I had to stop listening to music and I didn't even realize it because, you know, once the baby is asleep, you don't want anything yeah. to happen. It's <laughs> <laughs> going to make the baby. Um, but now that they're older, like, you know, I can, I've gotten back into the habit of listening to music because that, that was something that I would do as a part of my daily ritual. Like I would get up and then I would, 
one of the first things I would do after I would like, you know, say a quick prayer, or do a quick meditation or whatever is to, you know, play some music to set the tone of my day. So I really started getting back into that now that the children are older and they like it too. So, you know, they have their favorite songs that we listen to together. Mm-hmm. Um, I also, I just like being around like beauty, beauty like beautiful mm-hmm. things, cool smells and good food. I like to cook a lot for my family. I watch cooking shows for fun to kind of release and get ideas mm-hmm. to cook anyway. Like I might as well, you know, cook something fun that I enjoy. Scented candles are a really big thing that I enjoy. And it's just, you know, these small things yeah. that I can do throughout the day just to kind of take care of myself. And, you know, and then some days I'll have like a day where, okay, I need to, I'm going to spend this time, I'm going to retighten my locks or do a new hairstyle or give myself a pedicure. Um, but I think, you know, and a lot of people have been talking about self-care that I listen to in and outside of the arts. And so, you know, self-care doesn't always have to be that I have to go spend a weekend at a spa. It could be, you know, just these little things that you do throughout the day. Yeah, just mm-hmm. to give a little treat and take care of yourself. So Yeah. Do you get a chance to dance at all anymore? I mean, I guess I'm guessing maybe in the maybe in the kitchen, like, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, in the, in the kitchen. And so I I use dance as um, exercise as well. I really enjoy being physically active. So um, you know, I have like dance DVDs that I'll do, but it's more for like cardio, not mm-hmm. like I'm trying to a routine or something like that. So I do engage in that, just not like I how I did in college where I would dance with a group or something like that. Well, beautiful. Well, to kind of just to, to wrap up, I'd love it if you could let us know if there's anything particularly that you're looking forward to coming up. I know it's kind of a strange time to talk about the future with COVID-19 and everything, but is there anything that's on the horizon that you particularly want people to know about? Uh, exhibitions, publications, anything Yeah, that's on the horizon that, it, that would be good for people to watch out for yeah I do um so actually today um it was announced that I am a finalist in the Janet and Walter Sondheim Artscape Prize it's kind of a big deal here in the DMV area so um there's a total of five finalists and we are all you know competing to win $25,000 oh uh so normal there yeah I know right <laughs> Normally there is a um, exhibition that happens at the Walters Art Museum. Unfortunately, that's not possible anymore again due to COVID-19. So we're doing an online exhibition this year. Um, and those open up on July 6th is when our galleries will be open to the public. So um, you can go to my Instagram, it's Latoya Hobbs, L-A-T-O-Y-A-H-O-B-B-S. And you can find more information about how to gain access uh, to the online gallery when it opens next week. And uh, some other things that, you know, have also been put on hold uh, due to COVID-19. So I, earlier in the year, I got noticed that I was going to be um, in the next issue of New American Paintings. I'm not sure what's happening with that again, now that COVID has wreaked havoc on our, yeah. <laughs> on our world. But I think the next like major thing that I'm really excited about is that I will be in an exhibition at the Baltimore Museum of Art in spring of 2021. It's going to be um, an exhibition of four women artists here um, in Baltimore. So I'm really excited about that. And I'm going to be starting um, a new large scale work specifically for that mm-hmm. to, to that show. So Beautiful. Well, I will absolutely link to all of that. And yeah, I just want to Thank you for taking some time out of your evening and talk to me. It's been just a, a pleasure and, and just beautiful to hear everything that's going on. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. And I will be in touch um, about kind of publication dates and anything like this as well for the podcast. And again, just absolutely a pleasure to get to know you and your work better. And congrats and best of luck on the on the prize. Thank you. Thank you so much, Latoya. I will be in touch. All right. Good night. Well, that's our show for this week. Join me again next week when my guest will be Andrew Fingerhut. Andrew is a publisher of prints who collaborates with artists and printmakers all over the world and connects them to create work through raking light projects. We talk about building a business which relies on connecting strangers, the perhaps surprising historical connections between Japanese woodblock and tattoo traditions, and why is it that printmakers love tattoos so very much? You won't want to miss it. 
This episode, like all episodes, was written and produced by me, Miranda Metcalf, with editing help from Timothy Pauschak and music by Joshua Weber. I'll see you next week. Thank you.